Today we have a look at the Commodore 1541 floppy disk drives. The most important work had to be performed on this uh, 1541C disk drive, which is the second incarnation. I used to own this back in the days and so I purchased it and uh, as fully functional, but unfortunately it turned out that the motor is never stopping. It continued spinning endlessly. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, the LEDs reacted normally and so this error description didn't match anything I could find anywhere. Thanks to the people at Forum 65 in Germany who were really, really helpful, we managed to trace the error through several um, corrections and uh, I tried to replace two chips but it still didn't work uh, after which we moved to the next candidate which is the CR6 and surprise there I noticed that there is actually some corrosion on the board so I had to clean that away and although visually everything looked good the trace was interrupted in this very spot <music> I decided to not fix the trace directly because the spot was too tight and to rather try to bridge the trace from the bottom side of the board. Uh, so first I checked where the trace is going, it went all over the board and so then I fixed a wire to the CR6 pin and then to the other side of the board where the trace was supposed to arrive and hopefully by doing that uh, we would be fixing the actual error that I had tried to fix all along. And of course after this one I still checked whether the connection is working. So now this is the moment of truth. We'll see. I haven't tried it yet. So let's take out the disk protector. So as a reminder what I had is that um, the LEDs work normally, this stayed on, this went off, uh, but the motor kept spinning. And now let's see, I will turn it on and let's see what happens. And the motor stopped. That looks pretty good. Okay, let's have I test now with the disc. I'll insert the disc and let's load. The head is moving, it's all listing correctly. Okay, let's start loading again. So, first test was successful. Next up is the voltage fix. Some of these European disk drives were specified for 240 volts and others for 220 volts. Now in Europe nowadays we have 230 volts. 240 volt is just fine for the specs because these drives work well even when they get less voltage than specified. But the other way around they generate way too much heat and that is why I made the following modification. In these European drives the built-in power supply can actually work both with 220 and 240 volts. It just depends which terminals are connected to the power. In this case terminals 1 and 2 are connected and if we measure their resistance we get approximately 48 ohm. Now if we want to change the specs to 240 volts we need to find a combination that gives a slightly higher resistance and I found it in the end between terminals 1 and 4 and that gives me roughly 53 ohm of resistance. These are the terminals that need to be connected to the mains power in order to get 240 volt specifications. So I resoldered these and I also documented it on top of the transformer and now this disk drive is ready to be used. The first and second generation disk drives did not have any possibility to switch the disk drive number. 
between 8, 9, 10 and 11. So my next attempt now will be to add a switch, so that it will work more or less like a 1541 2, which had dip switches on the back. This requires scratching two connections uh, called jumpers on the mainboard. Note that this is a second generation mainboard. I'll show you the first generation mainboard later. Now I made sure that with the cut jumpers the device number has changed to 11. So I'll first clean them up a bit with a bit of mini fluxer. Makes it easier to, to see what's going on there and it also makes it easier to to solder anything to it. And then I will just add a tiny dab of solder to make it easier to add the wires afterwards. Two, three. For comparison, this is what the jumpers look like on a first generation board. I performed exactly the same operation on these, I cut them and then I soldered some wires onto them, otherwise the function is identical. After that it was time for another test, connecting all the wires to see that now we are back to drive number 8. This is the rotary switch I'm going to use. It allows four positions and allows you to interconnect up to four wires to each other. Now obviously we only have three wires and in many of the cases we don't need all three of them. So now it was just down to trial and error because there were no instructions that came with this thing. So I just tested every single position and saw which wires had to be connected to each other after which I soldered them tight. So now I will switch it to 10, 10, that will be 11, back one, 10. Then we switch it on. Now one of the problems with these disk drives is that they have very little room for additional switches and stuff because we have this metal frame everywhere. So the only place where we can actually place a switch is wherever the metal frame has a hole. And uh, there is a very good one here in the back. Uh, this is basically a big, big sized chunk of uh, metal missing here. It's just beside the fuse. And uh, since anyway in the back we have all the cables and the fuse and everything, it won't disturb so much if we put a switch there. So I'm going to drill a hole here, just enough to pass the, the switch through it. And uh, after that, of course, I'm going to cut a bit of the of the piece of uh, plastic here. So let's drill now a hole through this one, and let's place the switch there. The switch fits best at the rear end, on the right side, at the bottom, because that's the only place where the metal frame has an opening that is big enough. Uh, this is actually located directly where the sticker was, so uh, the type sticker has been removed before this and uh, if I ever want to remove the switch again I will just place the sticker back on top of this. The rotary switch has one small protruding plastic knob. That one is important. It requires a small hole that you drill on the inside of the case so that you push that small protruding knob into it and that will fix the whole mechanism into place. This is to ensure that when you switch on the outside, the mechanism on the inside doesn't turn along, but stays fixed in place. This is the knob I want to put. I need to now cut a bit this plastic part, because like this it doesn't look very good, does it?
Nice, beautiful. Very stiff, very good like I wanted. It's going to be 11, 10, 9, 8. Excellent. I'm not going to bore you with the testing details, I just simply tested all the possible IDs from 8 to 11 and back for reading and writing and everything worked out fine on this one and also on the first generation 1541. Next thing to be done is the fan, which I'm going to put, I already checked the voltages, um, it's a 12 volt fan, but actually with 5 volts it works just fine and it is also less noisy. So this is upside down now, but you get the idea. On this side of CR3 we can get 5 volts. So if we put, if we put these 5 volts against ground here, we're able to get enough power for the fan and it's not going to be too loud. So turning it around CR3, the pin that I want is here. As I always do, a bit of mini flux. So the flux and cleaning. So now in theory it should be ready. The fan is blowing nicely to the side, very very quiet. So first attempt to try to fit the fan inside the case and it's easier said than done because there is again basically no room to fit any additional components and that's why I started using tape to test and try which positions would be the best. This first attempt didn't go all too well, uh, all the components were in the way. And in the end the best place is at the bottom corner where the voltage regulators are. There is a metal frame around them and that's exactly where you can fit in a small fan. So uh, after this then I uh, glued the fan in with super glue. I didn't want to use screws because they would be too destructive and uh, it's been working really well ever since and uh, it's keeping the insides of the 1541 nice and cool. <laughs>